Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dale Martin. Uh, I am a uh, now an emeritus professor in the Religious Studies Department, but for many years I was on the Terry Lectures Committee, which is why I am privileged now to introduce Judith Farquhar this afternoon. Judith Farquhar is the Max Pilevsky Professor Emerita in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Chicago and the Faculty Director at the University of Chicago Center in Beijing. Her most recent book, 10,000 Things, Nurturing Life in Contemporary Beijing, uh, published in 2012, provides an anthropological account of how contemporary Chinese in Beijing manage and cultivate their own well-being. Besides being an expert in traditional Chinese medicine, its history and current practices, Professor Farquhar is a sophisticated theorist, and after hearing her first two lectures, I would say also a philosopher. She might not like that, but... <laughs> the Terry lectures are intended to focus on issues of science and religion, with both sides of that dualism broadly interpreted. Science, including all kinds of study of nature and reality, especially including the social sciences, and religion interpreted as including all kinds of understandings of ethics, uh, meaningful behavior, value, and values. In her first lecture, The Myriad Things, Professor Farquhar noted that science and religion are not so different. Pragmatically, and Farquhar identifies herself philosophically and methodologically as a pragmatist, there's no essential difference between science and religion. All of us accept and work with the findings of science as they have been told to us by practicing scientists. Few of us have the math to check their work <laughs> ourselves. So especially in today's world of quantum mechanics, cosmology, and theoretical physics, science is also taken on faith by at least most of us. Farquhar's first lecture introduced us to traditional Chinese medicine, including its important developments in the, in the 1950s and further in its revival in the 1980s. She forced us to consider what we are doing when we take something, anything, to be a thing. As a scholar of religious studies, I was amazed at how much her first lecture was about metaphysics and ontology. What kind of thing is a disease understood in different systems? What are we trying to avoid when we hesitate to call a phenomenon a thing? In her second lecture yesterday, Discerning Patterns or Thought, Professor Farquhar walked us through the actual clinical methods of the practitioners of traditional Chinese medicine. Medicine, we learned, is thought. Medicine is the disciplined, limited practice of discerning patterns. Medicine boils down to nothing but thinking. Via four examinations, looking, listening, and smelling, which is one category, asking examination, and palpating, broadly understood to include all kinds of touch and observation. Practitioners look for patterns of manifestations, images, and figuring out how to read them. If the first lecture was very philosophical and theoretical, which it was, the second was empirical and detailed. We all look forward to her third and last of these Terry lectures today, Humanity as Root or Action. I'm glad I looked up. I didn't have that last part. And I can't close today without uh, noting that I have known and loved Judy Farquhar for almost 30 years. And I can say that because her husband went back to Chicago over the weekend. <laughs> so don't tell Jim I said that because he'd probably beat me up. So join me in welcoming Judy Farquhar for her. He'd just be jealous. <laughs> he wants you to love him just as much. I'd love him too, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dale. And it's so nice to hear what I said the last two times because I tend to forget. OK. <clears throat> I'm hoping that this third lecture on reality, reason, and action through an engagement with Chinese medicine can, with an even more thorough attention to practice, shine a new light on some points I made in the first two lectures. I want to show how the imperative of taking therapeutic action is essential to the salient existence of clinical things and intrinsic to medical reasoning. It is not trivial to point out 
the inseparability of reality and reason from action, partly because Anglophone common sense still maintains a deep difference between thing and thought. We tend to see natural objects as external to consciousness, as solely and simply material, as discrete objects, like those floating anatomical organs I showed you in the first lecture. And the knowledge so crucial to thinking is too often treated as the cognitive contents of minds like buckets. This is Karl Popper's image. Buckets that collect a jumble of representations and concepts that more or less truly reflect an empirical world. Because I want to defeat this bucket theory of mind, as Popper did, and challenge the correspondence theory of truth, today I want to be even more pointedly pragmatist about questions of truth than I was yesterday. The pragmatist asks how the imaginable consequences of any fact being true suffuse, pervade, or contingently constitute both our perceptions of real things and our conceptions of what is going on. The pragmatist, pragmatist cannot see or think aimlessly. The Chinese doctor does not know pure contemplation of an external world. Practical people, they do not waste time with things and thoughts that are purely useless. But this means, of course, that they and I find it hard to identify anything real that is purely useless. Continuing to think about actual patterns of practice then, I will eventually open these lectures to some ethical and even political concerns that modern Chinese medical practitioners and perhaps all medical practitioners cannot evade because they must act and because they must consider the consequences of their actions. The epigraph for this lecture about crossing rivers by feeling for stones is my favorite image of how practical medicine and much else should proceed. But neither the Chinese nor the English translation says it all. When this proverb is read narrowly, one misses the feeling of bare feet groping along the bottom of a rushing stream, its waters obscuring to our sight the contours of the unyielding things, those stones that demand such nervous care from us. Perhaps you're not stopping to imagine the dangers of this operation, which negotiates slippery surfaces and possibly treacherous currents. Um, most streams would, moreover, seem to afford many crossing points at first when you're standing on the bank looking at the water's surface. But once you've tentatively taken a step or two into the water, your options for ways of refording the stream are progressively reduced. No amount of good thinking or advanced planning is going to get you safely across the stream with your eyes wide open but still half blind. You have to commit yourself to a course of action one step at a time. And as you go, you have to live with the consequences. Like any good Chinese proverb, this one can be unfolded even further, and I might return to it in what follows. But I want to really begin this lecture with a few basic observations about what Chinese medicine is like when it's at home in modern clinics in China. I will describe and analyze some observable characteristics of Chinese medical practice in today's China, but not comprehensively. After all, traditional Chinese medicine, or TCM, is an immense and complex landscape of contending opinions, changing institutions, and diverse forms of work. Today, I'm drawing on a particular clinical approach to TCM healthcare delivery that is rather well established in China today and most often encountered in hospitals and clinics, both public and private. I won't be touching on the practice of acupuncture and massage, which is a pity because they're very interesting. Instead, I'm letting herbal medicine serve as an exemplar of things, thought, and action. I'm leading you along this route across the stony stream bed of an important kind of Chinese medicine in order to explore an allegory for a philosophy of action drawn from Chinese medicine. So let's see how it works. So we need to get our feet wet in the flow of practice. The clinical encounter of Chinese medicine is most often conducted by fully clothed people with minimal technology. Usually the doctor and patient face each other, seated at the corner of a desk or table where the doctor can reach the patient's wrist in order to take her pulse. This arrangement of bodies expresses the fundamental composition of the clinical encounter. Well, yes. Uh, which in Chinese is referred to as kanbing, looking at illness. Doctor and patient look at illness together, equals in their orientation to the problem, but far from identical in their expertise. Several of these images 
are from urban clinics. When you arrive at such a well-organized hospital, you have to register for the clinic of a particular doctor. If you don't already know who you want to see, or if you're not sure who is on duty in clinic today, you can study the picture display of practitioners, specialties, and clinic days and hours that is posted inside the front door. Then you register at the registration desk for that doctor and that clinic. In the 1980s, when I was spending a lot of time in a Guangzhou hospital of Chinese medicine, registration meant that you received a tiny slip of paper with your unique number for the day on it and carried it with your personal case record booklet to the clinic you chose. In those days, patients or their work units managed everybody's case records. They were not hidden away in hospital basements or computers. Barging right into your doctor's busy room, where there are already patients, family members, students, and interns taking up all the seats, you leave your registration number on his desk or give it to an assistant. Then you wait, probably feeling miserable because, after all, you are a sick person, until your number is called from inside the room. Then comes the key gesture, around which I think so much turns. The Chinese medical doctor takes your registration number and pastes it to a prescription form. Think about the meaning of this gesture. Not a word has passed between you and the doctor. He has barely even glanced up from finishing the prescription he's written for the last patient. And yet he knows, and you know, that something will be done. Everyone expects an action to result from this episode of looking at illness together, at least in the form of an herbal medicine prescription. Neither of you is waiting upon lab results to confirm that you are ill. There's no danger that you will be told to go home and suck it up. It's all in your head. In the Chinese medical clinic, there are no purely imaginary illnesses. Both you and your doctor presume that everything is not right with you, and both of you are confident that there will be something in the vast Chinese pharmacopoeia that can address the problem. Even if you're only feeling just a bit subnormal, and this is a thing, by the way, it's called Ya Jian Kong, uh, you both know there are powers that can be deployed by the doctor to tune you up and make everything work a little better. Okay, so now you know you're going to go away with some medicine for your discomforts, though neither you nor the doctor knows for sure whether it will work as hoped or whether it will work immediately. In modern clinics, the doctor prepares to formulate an intervention by looking, listening, smelling, asking, and palpating, as I discussed in my last lecture. Recall that you've carried your case record booklet into the clinic with you. You turn it over to your doctor or to his intern, and someone finds a blank page to record the information gathered through the four examinations. The various observed and reported illness manifestations appear as a simple list with a date and a signature from the doctor. When in my last lecture I talked about the four examinations and the kind of information they collect, I wanted to emphasize the qualities and images on the surface of things which are perceptible by the doctor looking at illness manifestations. But take a closer look at the slide, at, at this slide, the, uh, which we also had last time. These signs and symptoms are not just images or manifestations. When negative attitudes, no appetite, greenish tongue coating, or a thin, taut pulse all turn up as part of the same unstructured list, they provide more information to read than any direct examination of the surface of bodies could. What broad aspect of reality does the four examinations method actually examine? I propose, influenced by my teachers in the institutions of Chinese medicine and by William James, the radical empiricist, that this category is experience. These symptoms are experiences of illness disorder of various sizes and shapes. Perhaps then the patient may report anxiety and excessive dreams, or he notes that he had a bad flu before developing arthritic pains, or she confides that she works in a Sichuan restaurant kitchen and is constantly breathing the odors of spicy food. Perhaps he confesses to feeling a heaviness and pressure in his chest, or she says she feels a lumpy obstacle deep in her throat. All of these are very significant contributions to the thinking of the Chinese medical doctor as he engages in what I call cognosis of the illness pattern. He does not doubt the patient's account, nor does he worry that the patient might be deceiving himself with a merely plausible myth of affliction. Those facts reported by the patients learned from the asking examination are not less or more meaningful than the pulse and tongue images that can be observed in the present. 
or the immediately perceptible skin rash, stiff movements or greenish skin that might be seen around the eyes. The presumption is that the patient is the expert of her own experience, and ultimately, this is a pragmatic empiricist point, experience is all we have to go on. Experience, I hasten to insist, is not confined to fortress-like individuals, but is most often fluently shared in collectives of many kinds. In some, symptomatic experiences are written down in your case record booklet and become the trusted factual things with which therapeutic action must deal. With this point, perhaps you hear my implicit contrast with some situations in our North American biomedical clinics, at least as these are perceived from the patient's point of view. When I report to my excellent and tactful primary care physician in Chicago that the sleeping pills I was taking to control jet lag produced panic attacks, she is kind, but she is not interested. This kind of symptom is my concern, not hers. She doesn't know what to do with panic as a sign of organic disorder. A Chinese medicine doctor does. But how? Well, bear in mind that any experience can count. My TCM doctor conceives of the accumulated recorded knowledge of East Asia's several, hundred, several thousand year history of medical practice as a record of experiences. The archive is full of doctors' and patients' experiences arising from illness consultations. These are experiences of looking at illness together. These recorded experiences are not just miscellany, dismissible like my drug-related panic attack. Rather, they provide useful information because they have been grouped into standard, traditional correlations. In my last lecture, I showed a series of slides with examples of the standard classifications of experienced symptoms with six of the eight rubrics. Here they are again, just to remind you, to give you an idea. The first pair is cool and warm. And it, you see there's a long list of, of symptoms that might be classified as either cool or warm. The second pair is shallow and deep, similar list of symptoms. And the third pair is depletion and repletion, which is a good deal more complicated, but nevertheless, it's still a duality. And the fourth couple of the eight rubrics, yin and yang, is even more complicated. These systems are much more extensive than these slides can show, but I hope these lists give you a feel for the vastness of TCM's systematic information. Now, I could use the more elaborate correlation tables from which I took these slides to discern the patterns that afflicted me when I was having those sleeping pill-induced panic attacks. Agitation, pressure in the chest, shortness of breath, heart visceral system tension, and various more intimate bodily symptoms could all have been classified and correlated, and I could have come up with a preliminary name for my pattern. Here's my guess long after the fact. Warm repletion of heart system chi at depth. This sounds like a strongly yang disorder, and somehow when I'm feeling agitated in this way, I know that. And my Chinese doctor can know that too. Or he can disagree with my rough and ready correlations to offer a more nuanced and possibly contradictory picture of what's going on. In either case, both of us, doctor and patient, have to take a long list of experiences into account in order to properly classify them. And note, these are not just my experiences at issue. My symptoms have to be understood in light of the systematic arrangement of everybody's experiences, which tradition has given us. Once classified and correlated, as I will soon show, my experiences, my signs and symptoms, and especially my patterns of disorder, my Zheng Ho, become actionable. And that is the whole point of pulling off these correlations, to make it possible to intervene in a specific way for a specific disorder. I'll return to this question of how personal experiences of illness are linked to the long history of collective medical experience. But first, I, want to leave, I don't want to leave our TCM clinics without finishing the story of what happens in them. As the doctor is collecting all your experiences of discomfort, while your signs and symptoms are being noted down in a list in your case record booklet, analysis is already underway. The doctor is, for example, classifying your signs under the four rubrics according to the traditional correlations I just listed. The other analytic system she has available, I highlight a few in this slide, also classify and correlate experiences in order to characterize the pattern more abstractly. Thus, my doctor might arrive at a pattern name like the one I speculatively proposed above, warm repletion of heart system chi affecting the protective ying sector at depth. In many clinics, a pattern name like this, even if it is shorter and less clumsy, 
is not written in the case record booklet. Even more interesting, many doctors don't bother to write down the treatment principles guiding their choice of drug formula. The moment of determining therapy in this practical, logical formation quite often goes without saying. Perhaps keeping some key strategic insights off the record is a form of resistance to biomedical diagnostic and technical regimes or rejection of the clinical protocol in modern China. But when I asked doctors to explain to me what seemed like a crashing silence about strategies for therapeutic action, they patiently explained that these abstractions are not needed. Everything the experienced clinician needs to know about the patient and his disorder and about any previous clinician's interpretation of that situation can be understood from a reading of the series of herbal prescriptions. Many times I've seen doctors and even TCM amateurs gaze appreciatively on a prescription written in a previous clinical encounter. They might say, oh, are you still constipated? Or clearly the weather was getting to you then. Let's figure out how to reduce your body's humidity. I want to emphasize then, the Chinese medical herbal prescription is at the heart of the field. For insiders to the field, it embodies the central form of action and it is a key expression of its medical author's expertise. The prescription consists of the names of six to 20 natural medicines, vegetable, mineral, a few animal, processed in various ways, carefully quantified in grams. There are many classic prescriptions and most of the time any actual prescription is built on the foundation of a well-known formula. This formula is not only written on a prescription form, it should also be recorded in the patient's personal booklet. That way, the next time she sees the doctor, he'll be able to know without being told, except by looking at the list of herbs, what was happening before and what was done about it. Our clinician then concludes the clinical encounter by writing an herbal prescription on a form with the patient's registration number attached for the use of the pharmacy and the hospital cashier. As our doctor is writing, she thinks back not only to her methods of pattern discernment, but also recalls the presenting symptoms. The doctor might add a medicine for insomnia or constipation to a formula traditionally intended mainly to improve, let's say, the dredging and draining function of the liver system. Speaking as a patient, we can see this perceiving and thinking at work as the doctor acts to intervene with medicines. She appears to concentrate as she is designing and quantifying the formula, but she sometimes stops and double checks something. Did you say you had trouble falling asleep? Do you wake up with a headache? The designer of a prescription not only needs to make sure that the various drugs cooperate well among themselves to advance a complex therapeutic agenda, he wants to address even the peripheries and surfaces of your pattern by customizing your drug cocktail. Reflecting on the practical form of the clinical encounter of Chinese medicine, let me make two other points before returning to more general questions of action. First, we might note how satisfying it is to the patient, to me with my jet lag induced miseries, to respond to my TCM doctor's curiosity about so many aspects of my personal bodily life. He's not trying to reach a reductive diagnosis that authorizes him to ignore my miscellaneous subjective discomforts. Rather, he's trying to figure out how to keep all our experiences in play together to understand a complex pattern or grain or currents and eddies of this moment in my embodied life. This is especially evident in the writing, sometimes in beautiful and much admired calligraphy of an herbal prescription. And the botanical and pharmacological complexity of any herbal prescription is deeply appreciated by doctors and patients alike. There's an intimacy to this clinical relationship, which by the way, really ought to extend over multiple visits to look at illness with your Chinese doctor. And this is the second observation I want to make about clinical action as I've described it. This closeness, this sense of partnership is most clearly and practically expressed with the TCM clinical sine qua non of feeling the pulse. I mentioned in the second lecture, talking about the four examinations, that in theory, there are 18 possible positions at the wrist where 28 different pulse qualities might be discovered. No doctors that I know of ever attend to so many pulse qualities. But it is interesting that they evaluate the pulse not just for speed, checking pulses against a wristwatch, 
but they compare my pulsing with the pace and rhythm of their own breathing. The doctor's own body is the criterion of health or illness. And of course, pulse takers are interested in so much more than the rate of pulsation. Pulse qualities are sometimes expressed poetically, taut like a bowstring, rough and catching like sandpapering against the grain, rolling like a pearl in a plate, skipping like a flat stone across the water, thread-like, flooding. In the feeling of the pulses, there is a kind of chi exchange going on. For those few minutes that the wrists are being felt, there is no problematic doctor-patient relationship, no question of a hard-to-attain intersubjectivity. The flow and transformations of chi, like the living transformations of the Great Way, are a shared experience, not a remotely perceived image. William James, defining experience, had an eerily convergent philosophical point to make. If we start with the presupposition that there is only one primal stuff or material in the world, a stuff of which everything is composed, surely he's talking about chi. And if we call that stuff pure experience, then knowing can easily be explained as a particular sort of relation towards one another, into which portions of pure experience may enter. The relation itself is a part of pure experience, one of its terms becomes the subject or bearer of the knowledge, the knower, the other becomes the object known. This will need much explanation before it can be understood. Indeed it will. This was written in 1907 and I'm not sure too many people have uh, noticed it since. But there's no time to recapitulate a Jamesian pure experience today. Rather, I'm trying to work my way toward characterizing action in a Chinese medical world populated with transforming things and thoughts. But qi, that primal stuff that is at the very same time infinitely plural, myriad in its forms and ever active, this is not a bad thing to think with when we're trying to focus on action. And I will eventually return to qi. At this point, we need to be reminded about the nature and centrality of practice by some Chinese thinkers. We've had Deng Xiaoping advising us to find our way across rivers by feeling the stones. We have had implicitly a Maoist practice epistemology at work in my frequent distinguishing between perception, as in the four examinations, and conception, as in the methods of discerning patterns. And one of our ancient texts, the one I both quoted and paraphrased at the end of lecture two, also gives us insights into practical action. So let's remind ourselves of that text. <clears throat> this fifth summary, summary summation says a great deal about action as engaged practice in a fluidly transforming universe. And it is quite consistent with Deng Xiaoping's little dictum about crossing rivers feeling for stones, in a way. But this assertion that medicine is thought does not read like a modern text. One of the most puzzling bits in this passage is medicines acting on the pattern like a god. I experimented with other translations of this phrase. You may recall that in my paraphrase at the end of the last lecture, I rendered it as magically effective. But what the Chinese actually says is, like a god. How does a god act then? A while back, I pointed out that standard practice in the Chinese medical clinic makes a standard process, pro promise. Your ailment will be recognized and our medicines will respond with a treatment. This promise is only implicit in clinic practice, but it is eerily similar to some explicit promises made by gods. This is the entrance to the great hero palace in Xiangxi, Hunan. In temples all over China, there are banners and placards like this one, which on the handmade banner says, Yo Cho Bi Ying, or to your petition, we must respond. I always thought this was an odd promise to make. How can either petitioner or deity be so sure that every need will be met in response to prayer and ritual gifting. Can doctors be just as sure of the magical effectiveness of their medicines? Well, they're not, of course. All clinical work is riddled with uncertainties, as medical sociologists have often shown. But Chinese healers do tend to think of the activity of drugs and gods in more or less the same way. Gods have powers, though Chinese gods are never omnipotent. And natural medicines have powers, powers that can be relied upon in a relationship of engagement and participation, as our text says, on occasions when people seek a solution to complex patterns of disorder. Let's look at another aspect of the Chinese passage. One thing with which the knower engages is with the sorts of things. 
It appears that all the modern classification work that, as we've seen, groups medical experience into correlated rubrics, systems, and sectors is not just modern. Even in the fifth century when this quote was first written, it was clear that illness phenomena could not be engaged with, engaged with as a pure infinity, a boundless myriad experience of the transformations and changes is far from being just one damn thing after another for the medical <coughs> practitioner. No, medical experts know that it is necessary to work with the sorts, to sort things out. Symptoms classifiable as warm or cool, shallow or deep, more heart than liver, more yang than yin, are not all of the same value, and treating the illness they express does not call for just any powerful drug. Drugs, too, come in sorts. The vast materia medica of Chinese medicine identifies each of its drugs with a character, allowing them to be classified as, for example, cooling or warming, as belonging to one of several efficacious flavors, or as having an affinity with one or another visceral system. The correlations of pathological symptoms have their parallel in the correlations of the materia medica. Hence the master statement in our fifth century text, doctors illuminate the pattern of illness and medicines act on it like a god. This is what medicine does. Drugs known to be responsive like gods after hundreds of years of attentive use and careful record keeping are brought to bear on a complexly specific disorder that has been expertly characterized in the clinical encounter through correlating and classifying. Although the rubrics and relationships used for the patterns are not the same as the rubrics and relationships used to characterize drugs, these two groups of sorts have a close logical and characterological kinship. The par this parallel sorting allows natural things to be applied from the outside where they respond minutely, subtly, with fine tuning to a well-characterized inner disorder as our text more or less says. Sorting things out properly and making things happen as desired in any given clinical encounter of Chinese medicine is not easy when you consider the ever presence of a huge archive of case records, herbal prescriptions, debates, experiences, experiments, doubts and worries, appealing mythologies and acts of faith. Medicine in China comes from the fabled 2,000 years of practical experience in the laboring people's battles against disease, as the Maoists used to say. Discerning patterns and determining therapy is the work of seasoned and well-read experts. These experts are scholarly and scientific, yes, but they are first and foremost clinicians. The potential problems that present to the doctor are very numerous. The analytical resources she can draw on are very rich. In a world of pure experience, tradition cannot dictate binding protocols or provide standard rule books for responsible action. Maybe this is why the text we've been reading emphasizes the transformations and the changes, even as it addresses limits to medical perception. At the same time as this early author insists on engagement with the classificatory sorts, it also praises the minute participation of the doctor and his medicines with the transformations and the changes. Everything is always changing into something else categories overlap, systems for sorting are only heuristics, and even they change. In these conditions, the landscape navigated by the Chinese doctor looks a lot like the quasi-chaos of the radical empiricist's world of pure experience, that nobody can do anything in a world in which everything is everything. Fortunately, doctors, writers, and educators in the world of Chinese medicine have some rules of thumb that respond to the infiniteness or the non-finiteness of the transformations and the changes. They tell their students and interns, and they told me, to control illness, one must seek out the root. Sometimes I translate this phrase as one must trace down to the root, because this setting of priorities is not an easy process. It involves a lot of groping around and getting your hands dirty as you distinguish between what is growing and what is dying away, or as you find or infer a taproot while trying not to damage collateral radicals. In Chinese medical education, I don't think anyone ever really explains to the budding clinician how to pull off this identification of the root as the practitioner correlates and infers his way into the darkness of pathological process and tries to distinguish between pathological sources and symptomatic manifestations. 
Even when you have a hypothesis about the most central source of the many symptoms you perceived, how do you know you found the root? How do you know that you're not just imagining your way to some plausible but ultimately bogus process that will not be, in the end, successfully actionable? Well, this is one reason medical education is an extended process in China involving a lot of work as a junior in the clinics of senior doctors, writing case notes at that crowded table. Indeed, those junior clinicians still in the course of their advanced medical education are expected to take the day's cases home and make their own copies of symptom lists and prescription formulas. Their clinical teachers encourage them to analyze and reanalyze the logic of each intervention, to relive the unwritten thought process by which an experienced doctor found the root source of a pattern and then designed a formula structured to distinguish between the most central aspects and those that are more peripheral. A Guangzhou authority I mentioned in my first lecture, Deng Tiatao, attempts a preliminary introduction to the problem of tracing down to the root in an essay, but he, even he doesn't explain how to pull off the magic trick of knowing for sure what the root is. This is a technical problem. I'm going to spare you the technical and theoretical side of his discussion, but one of his examples might be helpful, especially for intellectuals like us who are prone to headaches. He begins his explanation with this. In curing illness, seek the root, is a basic principle of the discerning patterns and determining therapies system, according to which you must seek out the basic reasons for disease and advance therapy on the basis of your identification of the illness essence. And then he provides this discussion of headache. We can see from this headache paragraph, with its list of patterns and its parallel list of treatment strategies, that the root being traced is not a structural foundation of the disease. It is not a lesion. It is not a population of microbes that can be wiped out. It is not a localized trauma in your body. Rather, the root causes listed here are all disease processes that have their vicissitudes and involve much of the person's body, not just the head, not just now when the patient is in your clinic. A root is a functional source of disorder which changes through time and must be caught in the act of causing human misery. The clinical imperative of tracing down to the main root, then, is inseparable from time considerations in both pathology and therapeutics. The question of timing is evident in some derived rules of thumb listed on this slide. The most important derived principle Dong Tia Tao explains is called root and branch, urgent and slow. Root and branch, urgent and slow, is a rule of thumb that references the flexible deployment of the principle of teaching illness by seeking the root. And then he has three possibilities. Just looking at the first of these three directives, we can see that knowing the difference between root and branch phenomena is really important. Dung supplies an example to help us see the urgency of keeping these things properly sorted. When it is urgent, treat the branch, especially if the branch phenomena are life-threatening or making it impossible to treat the root. For example, in a patient with liver disease who is manifesting severe symptoms of abdominal edema and distension, shortness of breath, and no urination with constipation, you should first resolve the branch phenomenon of abdominal fluids, cause urine and feces to pass through, reduce abdominal distension, and when the condition has stabilized, then you can treat the root, which is the liver system. So we can see that these medical images of roots and branches arise from an experienced pragmatism of the clinic, even though these little written lessons still don't tell our young medical students how to be sure they have grasped the essential nature of the liver disease from which our patient is suffering. But I think they gradually learn to see things from the perspective of an experienced clinician like Deng Tiatao. That is, they know they will have to make a distinction in each case of illness they face between essence and epiphenomenon between primary and secondary problems, between roots and branches. Tracing the root requires thought, and as I've noted above, it demands that the infinity of significant manifestations be limited or be subjected to a sorting process in which we let tradition show us some reliable patterns. Moreover, the things recognized by medicine must also become salient images we face only as actionable situations. The transformations and the changes can throw up a lot of strange images, but the images we face 
those, these duexiang, you'll remember this term, I'll go back to it, these duexiang that are handy by, and the patterns we recognize, or cognos, are that subset of the possible that we call the actual. But let's look again at Deng Tiatao's uh, rule of thumb about roots and branches. In defining his principles, Deng uses the term linghua, which usually means flexible and agile, responsive and efficacious. This is a word that is often used to describe the talents of the most inspired and respected doctors in traditional medicine. It is a beautiful word combining hua, a word for living, with ling, which perhaps most basically means effective. Gods and spirits are ling. After all, if you present a need, they must respond. The magic acts they pull off are evidence of their ling effectiveness. Medicines are ling, too. We've already seen that medicines properly deployed can act like a god. Perhaps this little adjective linghua can be pushed to remind us that a good doctor is magically lively, an embodiment of effective vitality. Buried in Deng Tiatao's rather dry and technical explication of some essential clinical rules of thumb then, we find a nearly religious attitude toward clinical practice. It can be done not only properly but brilliantly, magically, if you know how to trace symptomatic experience down to its roots. Now that Linghua magical vitality has brought us back to questions of practice, I want to start fulfilling some promises I've been making in these lectures, promises that I have not yet kept. Most obviously, I haven't even broached the topic of humanity announced in my title for this lecture. But I also haven't finished with that other modern practice theorist, Deng Xiaoping, who invited us to cross the river by feeling for stones. So I want to return to groping our way across the river in our bare feet, a mode of practice to which I'm attracted, though I don't think it can be done gracefully. Uh, and then I want to explain why I posted a title like Humanity as Root. Think again about crossing the river by feeling for stones. This pragmatic method of making progress might be the only possible one under present world circumstances. And of course, Deng Xiaoping, the great leader of the reform period, thought that that was the case. But our metaphor re-examined allows us to ask, why would anyone want to cross the river in the first place? Why is our practitioner aiming to cross this stream to get to that other side? Perhaps we should just turn around and go home and forget all metaphors that urge us toward risky practices tending toward barely visible and possibly undesirable other shores. All kinds of modern Chinese thinkers have asked questions analogous to this. So let me abandon this increasingly flawed metaphor and cut to the chase. There is a stubborn problem with all pragmatic philosophies. They seem to offer no absolutist resources for a correct ethics or a sound politics. Fully aware that truth is collectively constructed, drowning in the transformations and changes of a vast natural way, we are thrown back on agnosticism about the nature of any one shared world or one ethical rule book. How can we direct our collective path? I think with this question, I've finally gotten back to some very Terry Lecture religion and science dilemmas. I want to conclude then by turning again to Lu Guangxin, a Chinese medical authority I've cited several times already. He's the one who chose to refer to medical things as Xiang, the image we face. Uh, there. In the 1995 preface to his collected essays, Dr. Liu argues that medicine is fundamentally humanistic. To make this argument, he references philosophical and clinical forebears as he makes his way through the pragmatic and relativistic waters of a medical heritage that, as I have tried to show, is far too rich to guide action in any obvious and consensually agreed way. Especially crucial for Dr. Liu's humanism is a line from the very famous early 20th century philologist and revolutionary Zhang Taiyan, who, few know, was also a physician and who wrote an important book on modernizing Chinese medicine. Zhang Taiyan said in 1929, the Tao is not far from humanity. The body of the ill person is its greatest teacher. Lu Guangxin's preface takes up this fascinating and somewhat puzzling observation and runs with it. In his conclusion to a section called, If the Root is Sound, the Way Can Come to Life, 
He touches on many of the things and thoughts I've been trying to put on our agenda. And here is a couple of paragraphs that he wrote. The self-health and self-curing capacity of human life-generating chi is the thing we serve and the thing we study. It is the thing through which Chinese medicine researchers must diligently become great doctors of the masses. Qi is that stuff through which we may become touchstones of genuine Chinese medicine. If we depart from this human life-generating qi, this root of life generation, which must be sought in the nurturing of life and in the treatment of illness, then we medical people cannot expect any genuine Chinese medicine to survive. He goes on. Hence the way of Chinese medicine advises. The way is not far from man. Let the body of the, person, of the patient be your respected teacher. The root of Chinese medicine's way, or Tao, is the study of the human. Learn from and with the things you serve. And he's thinking of patients, students, and bodies here. Learn from and with the things on which medicine relies, such as drugs and symptoms. Learn from and with the things that develop medicine, for example, scientific results, historical research. Learn from and with life nurturance and disease treatment in practice, and seek development only out of practice. Medicine at root is humanism. It would seem that Lu concludes here with a non sequitur. Why is all this engagement with things in practice, like bodies and drugs and books, so obviously humanistic to him? The only way to interpret this in his other comments on taking the human as the root is to realize that humans are ever and always, for him, embodied. Understanding the human situation, he's saying, can only be a matter of knowing how embodiment works through time, as perhaps you distinguish between root and branch, urgent and slow, and in ecological relations with specific life environments. Chinese medical people often say, we treat illness according to the person, the place, and the moment. Understanding of bodies, though, at least in East Asia, has always been most salient to the aims of medicine. That is to say, we know the patterns of embodied life in order to act wholesomely to improve human embodied life. Medicine seeks to know and adjust the course of the human in the great all-encompassing way. And Chinese medicine, Lu Guangxin knows, is really good at that. So I want to really conclude with one last polemical remark that gathers a number of the threads I and my various Chinese medical authorities have been weaving together in these lectures. And again, this is Lu Guangxin. The proverb, medicine is thought, uh, the proverb, medicine is thought, reflection on and by human beings, it is a practical concept that applies thought to the character of things. Chinese medicine is an opening. Investigate the border between heaven and the human. Penetrate the difference between illness and health. Accord with the way of life giving birth to life. Then heaven and the human cannot but join their powers for the better. This is the effective practical wisdom of a wholesome cosmos in which life ceaselessly gives birth to more life. This is the Tao of medicine. And it is here on this simultaneously natural and ethical terrain that we can see how an East Asian science, after all this technical material, after all this technical material, I think we can call Chinese medicine a science. Uh, this e an East Asian science joins its unique powers for knowing the patterns of human life and human suffering with the virtues of the myriad things that make up the vast flow of the spontaneous cosmic way. For me, for a long time now, Chinese medicine has been an opening to a new and different world of things, thoughts, and actions. It has allowed me to hear deep things talked about. It has had me struggling to understand. It has required close attention to translation. It has been an invitation to understand knowledge as a practice. I hope these lectures have been a way of sharing with you that problematic thrill that way of feeling the presence of the vastness of unfamiliar worlds. So. Thank you, Judy. We have uh, time for questions, and uh, let me ask you to come to the mics. We, we need you to come to the mics, not just for amplification, but because we're recording this. And so we need you to come to the mics for uh, questions. And please uh, make your questions as brief as possible and make them actually questions. <laughs> um, hello. 
Um, I was wondering how, how do Chinese medics see Western medicine? What's their take on, on the Western medicine? Well, they, they understand a lot more about Western medicine than Western medical doctors understand about Chinese medicine. You know. um, and, they, uh, and, and many Chinese, can, today, many Chinese doctors are well trained in uh, Western med biomedical primary care and various biomedical specialties. Uh, many of them use sonograms and x-ray images. Uh, they uh, can read lab results. You know, they're perfectly willing to uh, incorporate the te te technologies and logics of biomedicine into their practice. Um, and there are many various ways of doing that. There are some people who are more purist, as I've argued the last couple of times. But um, uh, Chinese medical doctors, or Chinese medical writers and teachers in the PRC today are also aware that they are kind of, they have to defend themselves against attacks from biomedical interests that argue that they are operating a pseudoscience. So there, there is tension between the fields, but there's also constant in every clinic, many complex combinations of the fields. Does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you, and let me ask you, uh, uh, to identify yourself uh, when you ask your question, so, we'll, so Judy will know maybe where you're coming from a bit. Hi, I'm Bonnie Kaplan, and I'm part of several programs here, including the Bioethics Center. Uh -huh. I'm curious about two ways, two aspects of um, Western medicine and how they would compare with the thinking that you've been explicating about Chinese medicine. Uh -huh. One is how um, are preventive medicine things thought about? You talked a lot about people's discomforts and symptoms and illnesses. Are, is there a practice of preventive medicine as we think of preventive medicine where you don't have to be sick yet? The Can second, I answer that question sure. first? And then we'll let you ask your other question. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's an ancient saying from mm -hmm. the Huangdi Neijing, the Yellow Emperor's Inner Canon, which is the mm -hmm. first century Bible of mm -hmm. traditional Chinese medicine. And that is the highest doctor clear, uh, cures the not yet sick. Right. So, and, and there is a very deep and long tradition, not entirely continuous, I think, but mm -hmm. nevertheless, it's been there in the literature for a long time, of life nurturing technologies, techniques, which are about staying healthy. And uh, there's a huge fad in China now, in the last couple decades, to mobilize these life nurturing techniques uh, in efforts to remain healthy. So preventive medicine has all, and, and all the Chinese medical politicos and polemicists have insisted since the 50s when they started to really totally institutionalize mm -hmm. that uh, preventive medicine is central to Chinese medicine. And actually you can see it in a different way too, is that Chinese medicine deals with so many subtle symptoms that you, you, you can't, you don't go to a doctor for them. You feel a little bit subpar, you're tired all the time, you, you've been bothered by bad dreams. You can, you can get help from a Chinese doctor, which is a way of um, preventing any worsening of your condition. So that's, that's maybe preventive medicine is a kind of a continuum, which is very much available in China, uh, but mostly under the aegis of traditional Chinese medicine, I think. Although, of course, public health departments are busy uh, doing public health education to prevent uh, chronic illnesses. The other question, thank you for, for that explication. Um, the other question had to do with ways of thinking about medicine and health in the Western world before we had the kinds of technologies that enabled you to um, do more of what we consider uh, interior diagnostic work, seeing inside the body. Um, so how would this compare with previous practices of medicine that we now consider, oh, those are no good, they're ineffective, but, well, but in terms of ways of thinking, like humoral theory or other and humors and so forth, yeah. it's not my field. I, I haven't mm -hmm. done any research on this, and so I don't like to just, you know, mm -hmm. engage in loose talk about it. But it, it's much easier to compare uh, Chinese medical logics and Chinese medical thinking with uh, medicine from before 1850 in Europe and America, I think. Thank you. I think. Hi, Tim. Hello. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My name is Tim. I'm a practitioner. 
He actually does this stuff, folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was wondering, the image of the doctor with the patient and you observing that, I was wondering what role you think faith has faith. in the outcomes. Ha! Lots of people think that uh, a doctor-patient relationship, when it's really working well, it's yuanfen. It's fate, right? It's Not fate, faith. Faith. Since oh, we faith. are in a religion oh, faith. combining medicine. Uh, I think faith uh, in, it's, it's, a, it's a classic medical anthropology term, faith in the healer. I think it's important uh, for Chinese medicine. It's important for biomedicine. It's important for every kind of healing, right? And uh, it's also not required for Chinese medicine to work. So there, there are some, some people, and not so much now, but you know, in a, uh, maybe an earlier generation, were writing about um, uh, the traditional medicines of various places and taking what I called the psychological detour. They couldn't account for why these medicines were popular and considered to be effective. Uh, in the places where they were, Ayurveda, uh, Chinese medicine, various kinds of uh, shamanic healing and so forth. They couldn't account for why they were held to be effective. And so they would take the psychological detour and say, well, the patient must just have a very strong belief and therefore a placebo effect kicks in and the patient recovers. But you know from doing acupuncture, I know from observing so much herbal medicine and taking herbal medicine myself, faith doesn't have to be there for it to work. Thank okay. you. Thanks. That's Mary Evelyn. Hello, Judy. I'm Mary Evelyn Tucker, Forestry and Divinity and Religious Studies. Um, I wanted to uh, just draw you out um, and thank you for this lecture. You might have mentioned this in your other ones, but um, one of the differences clearly of modern Western science is the individual rather than the context. Uh -huh. um, and <clears throat> I wanted to just draw you out in terms of the organic and holistic sensibilities that we talked about of needham and, and so on, uh -huh. that the, the assumption here is that the healing has to take place in relation to the chi of the world, the chi around one. Well, you so heard on. that in some of the things that I was uh, sharing here today. But, it, but it's an issue because I think that uh, modern TCM has individualized in order to persuade the world that it too is a medicine. Now we have this very ancient remark in the, in, the, in the West, medicine is the science of the individual, and there is no science of the individual, right? Uh, and Chinese medicine, as it modernized, as it institutionalized, as these uh, writers had to defend their craft and their skills against biomedical modernizers, they, um, gradually evolved the field toward more of an individual uh, discrete body kind of practice. So that holism, as it's used in, in a lot of Chinese medicine today, is about a holism of the body. That is, if I have a symptom in my ear, it's re undoubtedly related to symptoms that might be as remote as my feet or fingers, right? However, that's, that's one kind of holism. Another kind of holism is uh, tian ren he yi, heaven and man uh, joined as one. And a lot of theorists and philosophers of Chinese medicine like to end up their arguments with tian ren he yi, uh, but uh, that it's a little bit of a stretch if they're talking about the way medicine is worked today. Can I just follow that up? Mm. Though? Um, but, okay, apart from what you've just said about the modern context, um, the references in the text and so on are about the changes, the subtle changes and so yeah. on, the transforming. The changes and, and transformations. Yeah. yeah. So the transforming and nourishing powers of heaven and earth yeah. that the yeah. doctrine of the mean speaks about and so on. Yeah. Yeah. And that, so my question here would go to the, this, the object is still to have a sense of harmony right, with, with the natural world as the healing, uh, well, part or, of the healing component. Yeah, or at least collusion, collaboration, you know, being able to get on together, you know. But it, is, it, it doesn't really, it, it, that's why I think the Tian Ren He Yi logic that we get from some polemicists today, it doesn't leave me entirely satisfied because it divides the human from the natural in a very modernist formation, the way mm -hmm. it's mostly interpreted. And that's not the Tao. Mm -hmm. That's not, as you know perfectly yeah. well, that's not the way it was divided up in pre-modern writing. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. So. Okay, I don't want to hold up other questions. It's all right. It, if 
You want to add another question? Matt, might I? Yeah. Feel free. <laughs> just, just one more. Sorry, okay. Dale. <laughs> we got time. Okay. Um, so the, the Tao, though, or the context, this uh -huh. larger context, is in a Confucian and Taoist sense, especially Confucian, moral. Um, and this, the sense that this, the powers that are there are not separated from um, the individual as the healing component. So this non-dual sensibility that we talked about um, is, I think, a huge, uh, rich contribution of mm -hmm. traditional Chinese medicine, clearly. It is, and, and, and that kind of um, unity of experience, unity of process, which the doctor's classic sources are training him to see and know, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's a little bit too much everything is everything for the working doctor. So looking, do, you know, following my program here and looking back at uh, knowledge from the pragmatics of action, he has to sort, right? And he, he has to sort in a way that he can act on to help this patient who has come into his modern clinic, right? Mm -hmm. So he's not going to be um, engaging in uh, a cosmology. He's not going to be privileging a cosmology in which um, uh, the human is only one of the 10,000 things. Mm -hmm. and in which uh, there's, um, uh, instead he's going to be privileging a cosmology which I really think is modernist and not so much there in the classic sources, in which you have human and the, humans in their context, humans in their environment. Mm -hmm. And you can spend a lot of time worrying about what's the relationship between them, but it's a modernist problem, mm -hmm. yeah. I feel. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Mary Evelyn. Thanks, Tim. Valerie? Uh, hi, I'm Valerie Hansen from the History Department. Um, I love the quote from William James, and uh -huh. um, I was wondering if you might be tempted to translate the word chi into English. Uh, I have never been tempted to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Are you tempted? Well, imagine... How would you translate it? There have, been, there have been a lot of translations, actually. I was just looking at your book, and there are quite a few in Mary Evelyn's book. I, I, I recommend it to you. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I um, subscribe to the Victor Mayer uh -huh. School of Writing for the World, which is if you're writing for the world you, and in English, then you don't leave words in Chinese. So, um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm so tempted to go with experience. Pure that's, experience. That's, I'm just, I'm like, just mean, like, like, go with William James and that, say that, he was that, talking that about that may G. be a little too compa capacious. And... Um, I like using chi in English sentences, and I do it all the time with students and in my own writing and so forth. Of course, we all have to explain chi, and I'm always providing some kind of a definition or explanation every time I have it in any su sustained work. But um, so, can I ask I like, you for that? Pardon me. Could I ask you for that? I'm sorry, I missed lectures one and for two. For what? The explanation? Yeah. Uh, well, I most often rely on Nathan Sivens, very simplistic one. She is the stuff that makes things happen and the stuff in which things happen. Sounds contradictory, but that's the problem with defining it as a thing. Chi is a process. Chi is a kind of, um, uh, uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a moment in, uh, in the changes and the transformations. And so um, to, to try to define it as a, a, a noun with a fixed, stable reference is a mistake. And that's why the translation is always problematic. And my answer to all these kinds of questions is always, you, working from ancient Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, is you just keep translating. You're just always translating, and you never stop translating with different translations. And then, because the, you can't settle it, right? No, you can't settle it. And so you can try, you can try different things. And of course, I. I don't, um, you know, there are plenty of sentences that Lu Guangxin might write that have the word qi in them that I might not use the word qi in my translation in order to say exactly what I think he's saying. But qi is so contextual, you know, it just means something so... There's, in fact, there's a fascinating article in uh, one of the 1980s journals of Chinese medicine written at a time when a great many intellectuals in the world of Chinese medicine were trying to settle some big theoretical issues collectively for the whole field. And this is a much cited article on the nature of qi. And it basically says qi is configurative force, uh, or qi is always 
configured. There's myri a myriad forms of chi. So there is, there is n no um, uh, experience of unitary monistic chi. Chi is not a monad, right? But it is the, um, the energies of the myriad things in the, all their myriad differences. And they say for medicine, chi is the function of bodily systems. So the five visceral systems you can say the chi of the liver is its functions. And that there were many, many sentences written in Chinese that are framed that way. So they had to make a distinction between chi as a stuff that is happening in the world, right? And chi as a figure of speech, which is talking about happening in a particular way. Okay, we have time for one more Thank question. You. So I'm gonna to move to you. Yes. So hello, my name is Tanya, and I just finished medical school and I'm in public health. Uh -huh. And my question is, what would your response be to healthcare professionals who kind of want to know more about like the research evidence for acupuncture, or other Chinese medicine practices? And kind of how do you approach conversations like that? Oh, there are tons of journals. Tim could tell you, right? There are uh, lots and lots of journals of clinical research and uh, uh, bench research on uh, various aspects of Chinese medicine and uh, uh, herbal medicine and acupuncture. Uh, it's all, um, in, in my reading, I just, something just came into my inbox yesterday, the Journal of Integrative Medicine. Do you get that? You see that? It's, it's all very, 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 very restricted projects. One plant, one substance, one needling technique, and a big clinical trial trying to uh, evaluate it. And for me, that's, Great, I'm glad it's happening. Doesn't help me at all. But um, if you really wanted to be a complementary and alternative medicine public health public servant, you know, you could get those journals and you could study it all and it <coughs> maybe you could get somewhere with it. I don't know. Thank you. Uh, I would like to remind you there's a lovely reception with good wine and food. Um, following this in this same building, please journey over to the reception. We want to thank the Terry Lectures Committee and the Office of the Vice President and Secretary for uh, supplying all of this. And one more time, let us thank Judith Farquhar.